This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. So if I move on to 61, we get to the definition of a public company. Each element of this definition must be satisfied. If each element is satisfied, then by definition the public is a public company. It doesn't have to be quoted. It may be a public unquoted. But if it satisfies the definition, it is a public company. This is quite a shift within the last 25 years or so. Because up until 25 years ago, a private company was defined and everything else was public. Now we've switched the emphasis. Now a public company is defined and everything else by default must be private. So it's been a complete about face where we now define a public company. It satisfies the definition. It is therefore, it is a company which is limited by shares. It cannot be limited by guarantee. It has at least two members. Now, a member is the technical expression for a shareholder. They are not technically the same. For our purposes, we can say that members, shareholders are the same, but technically they're not. A member is a share, sorry, a person is a member of a company when their name appears in one of the major registers that companies must keep, the register of members. And if your name is in the register of members, uh, then you're a member. But you may hold shares without your name appearing, so you could be a shareholder and not a member. Or your name may appear and you may not hold shares, so you can be a member and not a shareholder. And there are situations where this can happen. And it was many years, many years ago the subject of an ACCA exam question, but it's not likely to happen again. So from now on I will refer to members and shareholders well, alternately, meaning the same, I'm not going to be specific. I may say member and I mean shell. I may say shareholder and I mean member. I'm not bothered. Okay. So it has at least two members. The Constitution, the document which gave rise to the birth of this company, the Constitution states that it is a public company. The name of this new baby, the name of this new artificial person, must end either with the words public limited company or the acknowledged abbreviation PLC. Now there is a possibility, uh, because the administrative area of the law that we're looking at is the administrative area of England and Wales, there is the possibility that the letters at the end of a public company are not PLC, but CCC. The Welsh equivalent of public limited company. Actually, it's in one or two of these answers, yeah. And you must also, when you're registering a company, you must also file specific documents, uh, one of which is a certified translation if the constitution is not in English. So if it's in Welsh, Welsh is a different language. I don't know if you appreciate that. They have their own language. So if your constitution is written in Welsh, there must be a certified translation translating it into English. 6th bullet point on page 61, it has an allotted share capital. Allotted in this context is pretty much the same as allocated. That is, we're going to create a company amongst all of us, so we've got more than two members, and we've designed the constitution, the document, and we've sought out a name, we've decided what the name is going to be, and now I'm going to ask you, how many shares do you want? There has to be at least £50,000 worth of shares, or the euro equivalent, or even a combination of pounds and euros, £30,000 plus €25,000, so long as in aggregate it's more than 50000 
And I'm going to ask you how many you want. So I'm going to allot 5,000 shares to Benita. I'm going to allot 10,000 shares to Yana. I allot 4,000 shares to Sandra, and so on. But I have to allot at least £50,000 worth. But you don't need to pay me. Don't pay me in full, so long as you pay me at least 25% of the face value of the shares which I'm going to allot to you. So 4,000 shares to Sandra, if they're one dollar, sorry, one pound face value, Sandra's going to have to pay me 4,000 lots of 25 pence as a minimum. She has to make that payment. Together with the whole of any share premium, if I'm issuing shares, it may be that there are a number of people who want to join our company. They may be prepared to pay a premium above the face value of the shares. So although the face value is only one pound, there may be people out there desperate to join our company and they will say, I'll pay you one pound twenty if you'll sell me a share in your company. Uh, in that case, the minimum amount of share capital, the minimum amount credited or received is going to be 50,000 times 25%, which is 12,500, plus the whole of any premium. And if I've allotted 50,000 shares at a 20 pence premium, I need 50,000 times 20p, which is another 10,000 pounds. So credited as paid up will be 25%, but I'm actually going to receive 22,500. The double entry, I know, I know you, you don't want to think in terms of financial accounting, but the double entry for this will be debit cash, 22,500. Credit share capital, 12,500. Credit share premium, 10,000. So that would be the double entry, the double journal entry to record the receipt of 25% nominal value plus the whole of the premium on this allotment of 50,000 shares. The remaining amount is, uh, is called a reserve liability and it's the reserve liability that you, you members, owe the company in the event that the company, either the directors say, now we're ready to expand our operations, but we have no cash. Let's ask for some more cash from our shareholders. And I can ask you to pay up to 75 pence more. You've already paid 25 pence. You now have to pay me another 75 if I ask for it. If the company gets into financial difficulty, if the company's facing a major insolvency, a liquidator is going to come along and say, give me your 75 pences. And you have no choice. You have to pay. Does that answer it? Yeah, that's the only time. There's no need for you to pay. You may choose to pay in advance, which is awkward bookkeeping. You may choose to, to pay the other 75 pence if you want. But why would you? Would it not rather be better in your purse than in the company's bank account? So, yes, you are able to pay early, but it's unusual. Okay. Down the bottom, page 61, the penultimate point, if a company does not satisfy the definition of a public company, then it is a private company. And although a public company exists from the date of its creation and it will get a certificate of incorporation to prove that it has been created, a public company is not allowed to commence trading until it's obtained a trading certificate. Private companies can. A private company, once a private company is shown to exist and it has its birth certificate, it has its certificate of incorporation, a private company can commence trading straight away. But a public company has to second, secondarily apply to the registrar 
for a trading certificate. And there we are on page 62, trading certificates. This is issued following application to the registrar. The registrar, just let me talk briefly about the registrar because we do meet the registrar on a number of occasions in later notes. The registrar is a, an employee of the Department of Trade. It is a public position, they are a civil servant and they are based at the moment, they're based in Cardiff in South Wales. They used to be in London, but I think probably for reasons of economy they've moved to the less expensive area of Cardiff. They have an enormous premises called Companies House. And the registrar of companies has an enormous staff who on a daily basis are processing the forms and the, the forms and the returns that this million companies are sending in. Every company has to send in at least one form every year called the annual return. But any copy of any special resolution, any uh, special notice, any change in directors, whether they be appointed, retired, any change in secretaries, or if the directors are removed, all of this stuff has to go to the company registrar. Any change in the share capital of the company, it's all got to go through to the registrar. Any amendment or change to the constitution goes to the registrar. So the registrar's got an enormous staff and they're processing all this data on a, on a daily basis. And that's who the registrar is. And you can apply to the registrar for your trading certificate if you are a public company. Private companies don't need them. The difference between a public company and a private company, or one of the essential differences, is the fact that a public company must have not less than 50,000 allotted share capital. A private company doesn't. A private company, there is no minimum share capital that needs to be issued. But for a public company, we've got to get this 50,000 allotted, of which at least 25% is credited as paid up, together with the whole of any premium. So we get our trading certificate by proving to the registrar that we've satisfied these minimum requirements of share capital. So we get an application form. I think you can do it online. I'm certain you can do it online. You get the application form and you tell him that the nominal value of allotted shares is not less than 50,000 or euro equivalent. You tell him also what the preliminary and formation expenses have been. Preliminary means expenses incurred before the company was created. And formation is the expenses incurred during the process of creation of the company. So you have to tell the registrar what your preliminary and formation expenses have been. And you must also identify the person to whom these expenses are payable or to whom they have been paid. So you identify the name of the person who is promoting the company, who is, who is giving life to the company. Now, so we fill in this application form with these three areas, and then we send the application form together with a statement that says we confirm that we have complied with the minimum requirements established by the Companies Act. And if he's satisfied, or I think it's a she at the moment, if she's satisfied, the registrar will issue us with our trading certificate. We already exist. We already exist because we have our birth certificate, the certificate of incorporation. But being a public company, we're not allowed to trade until we get our trading certificate. If a public company does in fact commence trading before they've received their trading certificate, well, that's naughty. The directors and any officer of the company who is knowingly in default is liable to a fine. But any third party who's entered into a contract with this pre-trading certificate company, any third party is protected. So they will not be liable to any fine. 
In addition, if this innocent third party asks for payment of a debt and the company doesn't pay within three weeks, then the directors become personally liable to pay the creditor. And then finally on page 62, we've created a public company, but for whatever reason the directors have chosen not to apply for a trading certificate, then on application to the court, the court will say, liquidate the company. If a public company fails to obtain a trading certificate within 12 months, then on application, the court may direct that the company shall just be killed, killed it off. Page 63. The concept of separate personality. Oh, the advantages, I'm sorry, the advantages of being a company as distinct from a partnership. I'm sorry, I'm ahead of myself. The advantages of being a company as distinct from a partnership. A company is a person in its own right. It is a person in itself. This is established by, established by, the case Salomon and Salomon. This in company law is the equivalent in importance of Carlyll and Carbolic. Carlyll and Carbolic at the root of much elements of contract law as Salomon and Salomon is, is at the root of company law. And it says that when a company has been properly created, properly formed, properly registered, once it's properly registered, it is separate and distinct from those who are beneficially interested in its success or failure, the shareholders, and it is separate and distinct from those who are responsible for managing the company's affairs, the directors. A company is an entity in its own right. It is not an extension of the directors, it's not an extension of the shareholders. You have the same principles here. Yeah? A company exists in its own right. And this is separate personality. The case Salomon and Salomon, Salomon and Salomon and Company Limited is the correct name. Salomon and Salomon and Company Limited. This is Mr. Salomon. Back in 19, no, 1890, yeah, 1889, had a company. Hmm? 1897. No, that's when the case came. That's when the case came to court. Dates are not important. 1889, he had a company, and he decided it was a shoe making company. He made boots for the army. And the army was fighting, as our army, army always is fighting, the army was fighting wars in South Africa called the Boer Wars. They're fighting away, and Salomon's company had the contract to supply the British army with boots. But then things took a turn for the worst because the British army stopped fighting, Salomon lost the contract, and the boot-making business started to go down. But before it did... Salomon transferred this business, a private business, he, he incorporated, he went, he went limited. Something I did with Benita earlier, I said let's convert our partnership into a company. He converted his business into a company. And Mr. Salomon took 19,994 shares in the company. Mrs. Salomon took one. And five out of his children, he had more than five children, but five children each took one share as well. So there's 20,000 shares issued, but the sale price, which he asked when I'm selling my business to a company which I'm creating, I'm going to say to the company, 
I want £35,000 for my company. And the company will say, for my business. And the company will say, oh, I think 35000 is a fair price. So I say, well, thank you very much for agreeing the price, company. I'll sell my business to you for 35000 And the company says, well, thank you, Mike. And it's the same person. But it's not. Because when a company is created, it is a person in its own right doesn't matter the fact that he has control, direct control of 19,994 and indirect control of the other six. The company makes its own decisions through him. So the company agreed to buy this business for 35,000. The remaining 15, therefore, giving me the 35,000 purchase price, was a secured loan which is actually technically called a debenture. It's secured debenture. The debenture was secured on the assets of the company. And in the event that the company can't pay this loan to Mr. Salomon, then Mr. Salomon can take the company's assets and sell them for himself and repay this 15,000 loan. The company got in difficulty facing a big insolvency. And in 1897, it goes to court. And the share, sorry, the creditors, the creditors argued and said, who has led this company into a liquidation position? Who has led it into insolvency? Mr. Salomon. Who is going to get the benefit of 19,994 parts of 20,000 in the event that any payments are made to the shareholders? Mr. Salomon. Mr. Salomon is effectively the complete 100% owner of the company. Mr. Salomon has taken this company into an insolvent position. Mr. Salomon should not benefit in any way from this liquidation process. And Salomon said, well, yes, I should. When I sold my company eight years ago for 35,000, you only gave me 20,000 shares and the other 15 was left on loan, secured. So now we're in liquidation. Whatever assets there are must first be devoted to paying off my 15,000. And of course, the creditors are desperately upset. Why should he get any money out of this company that he's led into disaster? And he went to court. And the court said, once a company is properly registered, it is a separate entity. It is not related to those people who are responsible for managing its affairs. It's not responsible, sorry, it's not related to those people who are beneficially interested in the success or failure of the company. It is a person in its own right. And if the person is about to die, we'll realize the value of that person's assets and we'll pay off the creditors in strict sequence. And Solomon is up there at number one. So he got his money back. And the creditors got nothing. That's the concept of separate legal personality and it's fundamental, I mean, it's fundamental in bold, uppercase, italicized, underlined. It is fundamental that a company is its own person. 